Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today we're going to British Columbia, Canada, to look at a case that has been driving people nuts for years. It was, until last year, the disappearance of Madison Scott. And uh, she disappeared. Let me read you just a little blurb from, from Wikipedia. Madison Maddie Geraldine Scott was a Canadian woman who disappeared on the 28th of May in 2011. After a party, she had attended at Hogs Back Lake. Uh, she had gone camping out there with a friend at the lake in a big party place, and she vanished from there. Um, the lake is 25 kilometers southeast of Vanderhoof, British Columbia. Uh, and one day after the 12th anniversary of her disappearance, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police did find her remains. Um, and she's been identified. And so this was a year ago, uh, uh, May of 2023. So now it's not a disappearance. She's not missing anymore. So it's been confirmed she is deceased. But a year has passed. There has been not a, I haven't heard a peep from the police, uh, the media, as to what they think happened to Madison. Um, we know she's dead, but that's it how she died, who killed her, and theoretically, they haven't even told us cause of death, theoretically she could have somehow died of natural death or some other, some other, I'll get into all of that. Uh, but it's a very fascinating case and has been often associated with what is called the Highway of Tears in uh, British Columbia because so many women have gone missing or been killed on this one road. Okay, so I'll get into that as well. First, I want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. Uh, these are always patron only chats. Uh, my live shows are live for patron only, and I do put them up a week later for the public. So all my videos are available. You don't you don't have to become a patron to watch any of my videos because this is an educational channel, and I would like you to learn something from it. But if you'd like to be in the chat room, there are eight live shows a month and a community. Please do click the link below, join Patreon, and that really helps support the channel. And it's also fun. Um, if you don't want to do that, please at least subscribe. That also supports the channel and the algorithm. Like the video, click the bell for notifications. And I always say this because people don't seem to know about doing this, besides looking at the playlists, which you can just go through all the different playlists and see if there are cases there you're interested in. But there is an easy way as well, and that is to go to the search engine at YouTube and put in Profiler Pat Brown and the case you're interested in. And you might find I've already done it. Um, and if you want to support the channel in other ways, I have my books listed below at Amazon. And there is a little dollar sign you can always click under the video. Anyway, that's that. Let's get on to this case. I, I do want to say one more hello to people in the chat room. Because uh, I said hello before the show started. So uh, Lisa S. has now come on in. And let's see, who else has rolled in? Taylor just rolled in. So... Welcome, everybody. Um, really interesting case. Uh, let's say, oh, let me let me get rid of the stuff behind me and let's go to the, let's go to the case. All right. So I want to start by talking a little bit about the Trail of Tears so you know what that actually means uh, as far as this 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 case goes. So there's this area which they have labeled the Trail of Tears um, and it is a bunch of road, just as really long roads to the middle of nowhere. Um, and that women disappear on these roads. Okay. Now, wait a minute, guys, I've lost the picture. <laughs> we have an ongoing joke here that I keep losing pictures and where's my picture? Where did it go? I can't believe it. <laughs> I started the show by losing a picture. <laughs> Hold on a sec. I'm going to find my picture. I can't believe it. What? Seriously. I'm going to go search for it. Where did it go? Um, really? I can't. Oh, maybe that's where I put it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll lose my mind already. Okay. Anyway, that's. It's their isolated road. It's an isolated road like that. But I, mean, I did have the picture here. I just forgot what it looked like. <laughs> the pictures are this big. Okay. So anyway, 
this is called the Highway of Tears, and it's it's one particular road that goes through British Columbia. Let me show you a. Uh, first of all, some of you don't know where British Columbia is. So I'm here in Washington, that round, the blue circle there. And if you go all the way up to the left uh, above the, 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 the border of uh, the U.S., you're now in Canada, and you'll see Hogsback Lake. And that is where um, that Madison went missing from. Um, and it's, very, it's in British Columbia, way over there to the west. Now, hopefully I have the, pic, the road I want to show you. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, I wanted to show you just a picture of, well, that's where Vanderhoof is. Uh, Vanderhoof is, you see Hog, Hogsback Lake, you see Vanderhoof, that's where uh, Madison lived. And you'll see that road going by, and it's called Highway 16. That is the Highway of Tears. And it is, it is quite a long road. Uh, I mean, hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles, however you want to look at it. Um, so it has been labeled the highway of tears because so many women have disappeared and some say 40 or more. And some say it's less than that. There's arguments about that, but these are two serial killers that this guy is suspected of being one of the killers on the highway of tears. This guy it's, it's, it's questionable. But let me tell you about these two guys. Just so you can see, this is going by Vanderhoof. So that's why people say, is Madison Scott a victim of the Highway of Tears or something else? Okay, and I will get into how do we even determine those kind of things. So let, let me tell you a little bit about the Highway of Tears. Um, uh, the Highway of Tears is a seven 719-kilometer Okay, which is, for me, I cannot, uh, my kilometer measurement doesn't work well because I'm an American. 447 miles. It's a it's Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia. So this is one huge highway. For me, 447 miles. Now, the reason this is important is because a lot of people think, wow, there's, the, there's a serial killer working this one spot. Well, 447 miles. Or, or 719 kilometers is not little spot. That's huge. I could drive from Washington, D.C. to New York City and back. So that's a long way. I, I can, I'm trying to think 447 miles. Where would I have to drive to? Maybe Boston, Massachusetts from Washington, D.C. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long way. Very, very long way. So the chances of one person being involved in these murders is unlikely. And, and it's, that's a lot of road. And for, unless a person is a, a long distance trucker going back and forth, the chances of them doing that 400, 400 miles is, is a little limited. Um, not that there aren't truckers doing that, but also on different portions of the road, you're going to have creepy people who live in different areas. And they may get on the road to go to work. They may get on the road to go visit a friend. They may get on the road because they're going hunting, especially in that area of British Columbia, a lot of hunting areas. So you have people driving the road for many different reasons, and they're not necessarily driving all of the road. So therefore, you have the possibility of quite a few people being involved in a road that's four, over 400, um, 400 miles long. So these were two guys. Um, one, one of these guys, oh, let me just tell you first, um, uh, you, you might want to watch 48 Hours. Uh, they have a very nice, um, uh, it's called Highway of Tears. Um, I'll, link, link, I'll link a free link below for that. Um, you can also see it in a couple other places, but there is a free one. So I'll link that. They go through the Madison Scott case very, very well with Madison Scott's parents and, and her friend and other friends and also talk about the Highway of Tears and these other possibilities. So it's a really good show. You should watch it. Um, and these two guys, just to point out what was on that one highway, along the highway, we have these different guys. In the show, they talk about one girl in particular. Uh, they show the father um, talking about his daughter who went missing for so long until they finally found her body. Um, she was murdered by this guy. His name is Cody Legobokov. And I, I'm don't know if that's anywhere near the pronunciation. Um, the police pulled over his pickup truck 
Okay. And they found stuff in it that was concerning. Uh, like like some of Lori, Lauren Leslie's belongings were in his pickup truck. Okay. And then there was blood there. And he said, well, I went, I went, uh, slammed a deer, you know, <laughs> and cause that's what we do. Uh, well, they finally went out on the road I showed you prior when I was searching for my missing picture. Um, so it's, you have the guy comes down a road like this. It's so long, but along the roads are these little, the, along the highway, there's these little roads that go off and they go off into places like this. So what they did was they stopped him and they, they did some dogs and they went down this road and they didn't find the deer. He said he slaughtered. They found the girl. And so she was down. It's not too far down this little side road, but she'd been the, you know, it's um, yeah, it's an easy place to kill somebody. Now what's interesting about this character um, Cody Legibokov, or whatever you say his name, he was one of the. He's the youngest serial killer in Canada. Started at age 19, that they know of, which is quite young. Um, he was uh, convicted of murdering three women in uh, 2014. Murdered three women and one teenage girl between 2009 and 2010 near Prince George, British Columbia. He is one of Canada's. Uh, one of Canada's youngest convicted serial killers. So if the FBI rolls along and says it's, <laughs> it's a white guy between 25 and 35, they would have been wrong. Uh, so because it's not always that. Um, and so and he was he went to school, you know, went to school locally. He was uh, let's see what was what was it about him? Uh, I just want to look at the background of him. Uh, it doesn't say much about him here. Uh, Basically, he was a high school kid. He played hockey and stuff. And then I guess he decided he liked killing girls. So that's what he did. So that was him. And then this this character here, um, he he is not necessarily what you call one of the killers on the Highway of Tears. Not necessarily. Because do we really know? Um, this character is actually an American. Uh, let me find this guy. His name is Bobby Jack Fowler. Uh, he was actually from Washington State, and he also ran around all over the United States, probably killing people. Uh, he, they call it rabbiting, you know, you jump from place to place. Um, and he was finally, he got, um, he had a conviction in, in Oregon for rape and kidnapping. And got 16 year, year sentence and he died of uh, lung cancer. Oh, that's a shame. And, um, but he was known to just go just so many locations, including British Columbia. Um, so he was charged with murdering a man and a woman in Texas in 1969, <laughs> but only got convicted of discharging a firearm within city limits. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> I mean, okay. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to use that one. It's like, all I was doing was discharging my weapon. I couldn't help it if they were standing in front of it. I don't know how he got away with that. He, he did methamphetamine and he had extensive criminal record. Oh my God. He's just, he, he's a, he was a character, but he was suspected of the, the crimes also in British Columbia. And one of them was tied to him. Um, let's see. He's a suspect in uh, three murders. His DNA, his supposed DNA was supposedly found on Colleen McMillan, one of the presumed victims. So now, there's a geographical profiler by the name of Kim Rosmo who does not believe that he is one of the killers on the highway of tears. Um, why was that? Let me, let me look at the one thing that he said. Um, Kim Rosmo does some really interesting stuff. Uh, he does geographical profile, but heavily research oriented. Um, hold on a second. My, 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 my phone's giving me a trip. Stop it. Okay, there we go. Um, if you're if you're studying criminal profiling, studying reading Kim Rosmo's uh, work is is interesting for sure. He is a former Vancouver po police geographical pro uh, profiler. He's on record having said, in his opinion, Fowler is not responsible for any of the crimes along Highway 16 between 1989 and 2006. However, <laughs> however. He was working in that area. 
Uh, he worked for Happy Happy's Roofing in 1974, the same year that Monica Ignis went missing. So you see the problem. If you've got people coming and going to, to different towns along this highway, does it mean they're responsible for more than a couple? Um, so, it, you know, they, where they make this sound like, oh, my God, you know, there's like some serial killer or a couple serial killers just rent or rampaging up and down this uh, road, killing, killing women and, and, uh, yeah, and girls, not quite that way. However, let me tell you what some of the issues of the road are. And it's very similar to remember the vanishing triangle I did. I'll, I'll link it below in, in, in um, Ireland where they had a triangle where a bunch of women go missing. The question is, are they linked or are they not linked? And why are so many women getting killed or going missing in those areas? And this is the explanation. Uh, again, my favorite Wikipedia. Um, here is a reasonable, I think, a description of the problem. Proposed explanations for the years-long endurance of cr the crimes and the limited progress in identifying culprits include poverty, drug abuse, widespread domestic abuse, disconnection with traditional culture and disruption of family unit through foster care and the Canadian Indian residential school system. Poverty in particular leads to low rates of car ownerships. Now, I think that's real interesting. Don't have a car and there's not good public transportation down that highway. What do you do? You hitchhike. And that's why they put these signs up that say, girls, don't hitchhike. Because no matter where you are in the world, hitchhiking is not safe. Because you never know whose car you're getting into. Even if uh, sometimes uh, girls have made sure they got into a car with a male and a female. It turns out the female is just helping the male catch women, <laughs> you know, so that sucks. You know, you're trying to be safe and you still get killed. But hitchhiking has always been extremely dangerous. So um, what's what's that joke? Uh, what is that joke where um, the, the uh, guy's hitchhiking and gets in, the, the guy picks him up and they're driving along and the hitchhiker says, how, how, how do you, you know, how, how do you, why, why do you want to take this kind of chance? How do you know that I'm not a serial killer? And the driver says, well, what are the odds of two serial killers being in the same car? <laughs> He's got a point. He's got a point. So uh, hitchhiking is often the only way for many to travel vast di distances to see family, to go to work, school, seek medical treatment. Lack of public transportation is another major factor. So this is, then here's another reason. Uh, abduction, the, another factor leading to the abduction murders in the areas because it's largely isolated and remote with soft soil in many areas. Really easy to dig that shallow grave. And carnivorous scavengers can also carry away the remains. So, you know, the biggest problem is if a girl's out hitchhiking and a guy's driving down the road and grabs her, pretty much nobody pays attention to any car that a girl got into especially if it's at night or there's just not a car that's right there. I mean, he's driving along. He may even look to see, hey, not too many cars. It's like, come on, jump in. Make sure you jump in quick because I don't want people seeing my vehicle. And then off he goes. Once he's back on the road with that girl, she's not seen as being abducted. He now has all the opportunity in the world to pull off on one of those little side roads like that, rape and murder her, put her out there somewhere. God knows where she could be. She could literally be anywhere. Oh, this is, this is the road. Like this is how far you can see the road going across roads like this water, like this, you know, <laughs> it's like a, a wonderful place to leave a body because it's, it's so the expanse is so huge. So your chances of getting away with it are really good, except for one thing. If you're totally stupid and get, and get screwed up for that reason, or you'll leave evidence at the scene. DNA evidence at the scene, drop your driver's license, whatever. You got to leave something there at the scene that says who did this. Otherwise, if they have a scene they don't have DNA from, they just have a dead girl in the bushes. Good luck. You'll never prove anything. You'll never figure out who it is. And so isolated locations, both for, for the uh, abduction and for the disposal, make this a very easy area. And I say 400 and what is it, 440 miles across a very long, large expanse of land. Who knows? I don't, I can't say it's one serial killer, two serial killers, 10 different serial killers and some domestic killers as well. And some boyfriends offing their girlfriends. I mean, there's so many op options. 
so many options. But it did become very, very concerning to people uh, because the victims were mostly indigenous women. And there's a, a group called um, the MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And they're working with the police uh, on a thing called Project Epana. And now they say there's only about 18, uh, but the Aboriginal organizations estimate more than 40. So the, obviously this is a big concern for the families up there in Canada and British Columbia. So that is the highway of tears. Now I'll get to now was Madison. I'll go to the story of Madison and see whether it matches anything of a serial killer nature or, or is it something else? All right. So let's get back to Madison. And Madison was just, by the way, seems to be a really cool. Well, she was a really cool girl. I, I just really, I just really liked her. Um, she just seemed like a, I don't know, fun person. Um, she, she was very involved in sports and camping and she helped her dad out and she just, all around seemed like a great person. Um, uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about her. She was born in, um, now let me look for my little picture. <laughs> and there she is. All right. Um, so Madison, uh, she had two siblings. Um, she enjoyed dirt biking, figure skating, horseback riding, team sports, and hanging out with her friends. She was an energetic person. Uh, she worked as an apprentice. Uh, and heavy duty, uh, she was an apprentice heavy duty mechanic in the logging industry with her father. That's pretty awesome. She was described by her brother as someone who was comfortable in a dress as she was in work coveralls. She spent most of her life in Vanderhoof, where she graduated from the Anachaco Valley Secondary School. All right, she was 20 years old when she disappeared. Um, she, uh, I, I want to point out the reason it's so important as to her background. She was an extraordinarily competent human being. Okay, some people are, they can't handle much. You know what I mean? They they can't handle themselves. They can't handle things around them. They don't necessarily make decent decisions. She seemed like a strong person. And this is going to really come into play with well, how, how she disappeared from the site. Okay? So keep that in mind that I think she could handle herself really well and was strong and comp and able to do things like, um, you know, she took her, um, her truck. She drove her truck uh, to the site and um, she had some stuff in the truck. She set up a tent. Uh, she, it per turned out the tent was, she was going to stay with a friend. She thought it was too small. She went back home, picked up a bigger tent, came back and put that up. Now I would not be as competent. <laughs> I mean, I'm not good at putting up tents. I've done it. I, I can drive a truck, but I don't consider myself. She's as, you know, like confident. Uh, I would like struggle through it. She seemed like she knew what she was doing, you know? So that's, that's kind of important. So she was 20 years old at the time of her disappearance, weighing between 160 and 180 pounds with a height of five foot four. Now I looked at her photos, by the way, because I often look at why women, how women get chosen as victims and rarely do overweight women get chosen. I, she did not look that overweight to me. So I don't know. Um, she must have it really. Maybe she's a solid muscle because she, she, she looked pretty normal weight to me. So that, that can be an important when you're looking at a victim and why somebody would choose her to do something to her. She had a nose piercing and numerous ear piercings. And that does have, that does play a little bit into this. Scott had the inside of her left wrist tattooed with the image of a bird. Okay. So she was described as vivacious, fun, loving, Playful, social personality, loved to do things on the spur of the moment, affectionate and generous. She performed in amateur video productions, which you'll see in the 48 hours. Um, so you can see what she's like. She just, she was great, you know, in school. Just a really nice girl. You know, she's the kind of person that if I'm, I'm, if she were the same age as my daughter, I'd say, hey, hang out with her. She's cool. You know, um, so, but what happened? She went to a place called Hogs Back Lake in her 1994, I'm sorry, 1994 F-150 pickup truck. Okay, so she went with, this is her, she had a pickup truck, okay? And she went with her friend, Jordy Bolduck. Okay, let me show you Jody. Oh, this is, this is Jody. This is her friend, Jody. And... 
she became the number one suspect for a very long time. And you're going to see why. And she supposedly is no longer a suspect. And well, we'll, ex we'll examine that. But that's her friend, Jody. She and Jody went in her white pickup truck. So let's go back to the white pickup truck. There it is. All right. Uh, they went to this Hogsback Lake. Let me, oh, let me show you where the Hogsback Lake is. All right. So Hogsback Lake is on one of these pictures. I'm going to guess. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Got lucky. Okay, so Vanderhoof is up there, and Hogsback Lake is down there. It's a, so a little southeast. It's not far away, 20, 20 25 minutes driving. Uh, they, it seems to be faster going from Hogsback to um, Vanderhoof than you'd think, but maybe it's because the road is empty and you're like, you know. So anyway, she, she drove a truck, and she, uh, for a party, there was a, a party of young people that were going to be at the lake having a good time on the evening of May 27th, 2011. But she, so she retired to her tent and she was in her tent and uh, in her sleeping bag. And she sent some messages to her dad. Hi dad, what's up, whatever. Around midnight, now she, so she supposedly, now I wanna point out a couple things about what we actually know, because we don't. I have never accessed the police reports. Oh, I wish I could. Her parents, by the way, I've done some extraordinary work. Um, they um, were on the show showing this. Um, um, these are her parents, and they have a whole room dedicated. They have wall. It looks like one of those things you see in a police, you know, a movie, one of the uh, police shows where they have. She has. They have walls full of information where they write everybody's name, put the pictures up, all the people that are at the party, like fifty some people, exploring everything they can. I would like to know what they know. And I would like to know what the police know. Very little information is out on the internet. Very little. Okay. Um, so it's very hard to know what any of the interviews of all those people, supposedly they were all um, given polygraphs and everybody passed or something like that, but I have no idea. Uh, but there's a couple questions I really, really, really want to ask. I would want to know the answers to these things if I had that kind of opportunity. But so anyway, she shows up with her friend, Jody, um, Jordy, sorry, Jordy, Jordy Boulder for this party. She retires to her tent. So it's interesting. She didn't spend, she wasn't like still out there drinking up, up a storm. She had retired to her tent, was talking to her dad. Seems like a very responsible young woman. And then a fight broke out around midnight and Bolduck injured, left with her new boyfriend. Okay, so supposedly... Supposedly, Jordy had like a sprained ankle or something like that. Um, how badly it was sprained, I do not know. Uh, I don't hear of her going to the emergency room. There was supposedly some blood from Jordy in the tent, which is supposedly from the sprained ankle, like she got scraped or something. Um, so a lot of people have asked, you know, if, if Jordy was out there drinking up a storm and she was pretty intoxicated and she, somebody hit her and she fell over, not, she not, she was not necessarily in the fight. I, I can't get this clarified, but I, it sounded more like there was a fight and, you know, somebody backed into her and she went down. So now her, she supposedly sprains her ankle. Now, theoretically, she could just go sleep it off in the tent. You're already drunk. Just, just, just go in the tent, lay down and go to sleep. I'm pretty sure that, I don't know, just... I would say that Madison Scott would probably be the person that has a little emergency kit and, you know, some, some, at least some uh, painkillers like Advil or something in it. She could have just laid down and gone to sleep and wor worried about whatever in the morning. I don't hear about her going to an emergency room. So it seems like she went off with her new boyfriend. Where the hell did he come from? But anyway, he wasn't with them. It doesn't seem, maybe he was, but it doesn't seem like it because they left in a different vehicle. Okay. Now, supposedly, and I say supposedly because this is just what Jordy Balduck says. She said she and her boyfriend said to said to Madison, why don't you come with us? Because they don't, didn't supposedly want to leave Madison alone in her tent, you know, all night long with all these people around. She'd be by herself. Supposedly, uh, Madison said, no, she was fine. So Jordy left with the new boyfriend, whoever the heck he is, in his vehicle leaving, supposedly leaving Madison alone in the tent. Now, 
there is a claim, and this is one of the things I would love to see the reports and whether there's any accuracy in it. There is a claim that later on other people were leaving and somebody or somebody's asked Madison, hey, do you want to come with us? And she declined. That would mean if this is true, she was seen after Jordy Baldick left, which it which would be an important point. I just don't know the validity of that. I don't know if they're real. They're all drunk. I don't know. Did they see her before? Did they see her after? Did they just claim they they offered her a ride because now we feel bad? We should just offer her a ride because the police are asking us. Well, you no, know, she was alone. Did you offer her a ride? Yeah, I did. I saw her offered it a ride. Do we know this is any true? So I personally do not know if Madison stayed in that tent or if she went with Jordy. I have no idea. If she didn't go with Jordy, she would have still been there and other people would have been there as well. And then whatever happened to her theoretically would have happened to her after her friend Jordy and the new boyfriend went away in their vehicle. Now, mind you, she has a truck. She can leave anytime she wants in her own truck. She doesn't need a ride out of there. It's not like, you know, she's going to be left alone. And if something happens, she's got no way. She, no. And I don't know how many people stayed either. This is a, an important point. Some people say, well, and I, I, I will, I will uh, stand up for Jordy on this. You left your friend alone. Okay. She seemed like a person who camps a lot. I have camped myself alone I, quite a few times in my life. Um, why? Because no one, no one liked camping that I knew. And I had my, I was going to be brave and I had my camp, I had my tent. And I guess I wasn't as competent here, but I managed. And I remember one time I went to Assateague Island by myself, Assateague Island, Virginia, where the wild horses are. And I set up my tent there and, and the mosquitoes were like ridiculous. And I was getting like destroyed. By the time I finally got my tent, I was itching so bad because like, mosquitoes were every place and I was just being eaten up. And I said, screw this. And I, un I just knocked the tent down, threw it in my vehicle and left, not realizing that somehow I had left without letting them know the Rangers. And the next morning I was having, I was in the kitchen with my mother, when she, my mother got a phone call notifying her that I was missing from my campsite. <laughs> I was like, well, thank God I came straight home or you'd be totally freaked. So yes, do people camp alone? I was totally alone. There was no one in sight. Was that smart? Well, probably not. I've been, I've been alone in a camp site quite often in my life, which, yeah, might not have been the wisest thing. Um, however, women, a lot of women do this and uh, I'm a little bit less, um, you know, not as likely to do that these days. I'm a little more cautious as I, after I became a profile and I was no longer a stupid teenager. Um, <laughs> I got a little smarter. <laughs> Nobody's here to say that's not true anyway um <laughs> but you know there's no reason why there are people lots of people were camping maybe that wasn't a big deal was she the only tent by herself did everybody else just come and go nobody else was camping would that mean she was totally alone by herself was this a problem so jordy if jordy left her there because she said hey i don't want to go well Jordy, what's Jordy going to do? Pull her out of the tent and force her into a vehicle? I mean, Madison had her own mind. She thought she was fine. She wanted to stay. She could leave anytime she had a vehicle there herself. I can't, I do not think, I don't have any issue about Jordy leaving her there if that's what she did. Okay. As I say, there's a lot of people who are really upset about that. So anyway, supposedly Jordy left. And then other people there that may have said, hey, do you want to ride? I don't know. That's true. But in the morning, uh, Jordy returned. I will get into the details of the return of Jordy and then what they found, okay? But Jordy returned with her new boyfriend. I don't know who this guy is. Uh, came, they came back to the campsite at 8.30 a.m. to collect Bulldog's clothes and sleeping bag as she was going to work. Now, I don't know where her work is. I'd love to know that too. Was it south of the location of where the campsite was was it like further third more than 30 minutes outside of vanderhoof where the hell was she working you know i mean because there's not a lot of places to work i don't know i don't know what industry she worked in i can't seem to find that information out so at 8 30 in the morning she re has returned to the the site to get her stuff and she doesn't find a uh, madison scott there 
Um, another story was given at one point where she went to help Madison pack up. Now that one, I don't believe for a minute. Why? Because Madison is super competent. She's got a big freaking truck. Nobody needs to help her pack up. <laughs> pack up what? Pull a few poles on your, 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 your tent and roll it up and chuck it in the truck and then drive away. Nobody has to come and help you pack up. That makes no sense at all. And she comes back and to collect her things. Supposedly when she gets there, the, she, the, she finds the tent unzipped her, with her sleeping bags and items moved to the side. Now, I don't know what her means because this is a poorly written article and I can't seem to figure it out any place. Whose items are moved to the side? Was it just Bolduc's items removed to the side? Was it, I don't understand what this means. And it's important. This is, this is what you would call, um, you're looking at possible crime scene. Um, and for example, let me give you some examples. All right, let's say both of their sleeping bags are like this. Let's say Bolda comes back in the morning. She sees they're just like this. You would think, okay, well, she, you know, she just left everything the way it was. But if she moved Boldix on top of her stuff, why did she move that over? Why, what's the reason for the empty spot on half the tent? Now, one possibility is she met a really cool dude and that person said, hey, I want to come hang out with you. I'm bringing my sleeping bag. And he puts his sleeping bag on the other side of the tent. Maybe. Um... Don't know. Maybe the, the her Baldux sleeping bag was put on the other so that she was they were just moved over because they were gonna she was gonna wrap them up and put them in a trunk. I don't know. So that's an interesting point. Um, and she said she didn't see Scott and she didn't report Scott's absence to anyone, which is kind of odd, you know. So Scott's, but then again, then again, I'll give Jordy a little defense here. Madison was a very competent person. Maybe she thought she was out hiking. Maybe she thought, you know, it's, it's morning time. Maybe she went to have, have a good, go for a swim in the lake. I don't know. Maybe she was having a great time someplace else, make, getting breakfast ready. I don't know what she was doing. Maybe she didn't think about it because, well, first of all, she's, if you, if you watch the, the, uh, the <laughs> 48 hours, she's like a little, well, I don't want to label her a few things that she could be, but you're, you're watching like, she, she, she's a little not so together, shall we say. So who knows what she's thinking? Maybe she's just one of those, oh, I guess she's having fun someplace. And off she goes. Didn't pay any attention. On the other hand, here's a problem I have. What was left at that campsite that Jordy had any reason to go collect at 830 in the morning? She went to collect her stuff. What was there? She was going to work. Does she need her what? Her camping clothes? Her sleeping bag? Why does she need to go there? Why didn't she just call? Because the Madison had a cell phone. Why didn't she call Madison on a cell phone and say, hey, Maddie, what's up? Where are you? What's going on? Hey, when you get my phone call, don't forget. I'm not coming back. Just get my stuff and bring it to me. Wouldn't you just make a phone call and tell her to bring the stuff along? It's just a few items. Why would you make an entire separate trip to pick up your things? And this is why people are suspicious of Jordy and why the police were suspicious of Jordy for good reason. She has some stories that don't make a lot of sense. That's my problem with this. I'm like, why would she even go there in the morning? You know, that makes no sense at all. She wasn't concerned about Madison because she didn't bother to call her, or look for her, report her missing. She just was there to get her stuff that she doesn't need because she's going to work. I mean, it makes no sense. Um, so I have a problem with that. Uh, she also makes some claims that outside the tent, outside the tent was, was uh, uh, Madison's jewelry. She had a few rings. I guess she had a bunch of rings on her finger and, and you know, she had uh, earrings that were also outside. Can't quite tell how many. I thought it was three rings and maybe a couple earrings outside the tent. She's like, I don't know why they'd be outside the tent. Maybe she left it as a distress signal. What? <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> so 
she won't, so she's been kidnapped. So she's like, this, this shows I'm being kidnapped. I'm really, is that, uh, okay. Maybe, maybe Jordy knows some profiling things about kidnapped victims. I don't know, but that seems weird to me. And also what's weird to me is what is her jewelry outside the tent? That's crazy. Now, what they do know is that what was missing was the clothes she was wearing and her phone and her the keys to her truck. So the, the, the her phone, her cell phone, keys to the truck were, were missing from the tent. Her truck had her purse in it and a good a good camera, but the truck was locked and everything was still, everything was still in the truck. Uh, they see some stuff here. I don't know what, where, where the person, the, the camera was, but they were in the truck locked up. Um, a day went by and by the time her parents went there a day later, there'd been another more partiers and they had stomped on her tent. Okay. And so it was squashed. That's why you see that picture. Uh, and that was the last, anybody knew of Madison Scott just disappeared into nowhere until a year ago when they found her body. So I'm going to go to some of your comments so far. Um, one thing the police said, which is obvious to me, um, there were a lot of theories about how she fell in the lake and drowned. Uh, she went off hiking and whatever, but she took her phone and her, and her vehicle keys. Now, if you're going to go pee, I might take my phone if I go pee. I, all, I, I take my phone into the bathroom. <laughs> it's only because I don't, <laughs> I don't have one of those alert things on my arm. <laughs> and if I like trip or something and go down, <laughs> I like to have a way to call 911 <laughs> and not be found lying in my, lying in my house two or three days later, because my, you know, once in a while, you know, if, if uh, you know, since I don't work outside the home right now, I work mostly in the house. Um, uh, my daughter does notice if the car doesn't move, you know, uh, so if my car is there, she's like, why is the car not moved in two days? But by that time, you know, and so, so I always carry this and I just do that because it, it's convenient and, um, and it's on me so that it, I can't fall. It won't fall out of my hand. So it'll be here. So if I went to pee and I was uh, camping, I do that. And then I go pee. And then if some reason I fell into the water or, I don't know. I broke my, my foot. I can just easily pull my phone out and call. Um, I don't know how good the cell service was there. There could be issues with that, but she had called her dad. So I assume the cell ser service did work. So would she take her phone maybe with her to go pee? Maybe the, the truck keys. I'm not sure she would bother taking with her. Um, you know, like when you're at the beach, a lot of times she's like, you like hide them someplace, you bury them. You know, she, she had the tent. She might have just found a place to put it in the tent, assuming nobody's going to go into her tent, grab her car, key, truck keys and run off with her truck. Um, it depends how long she's going to be gone. I mean, if you're just going to go pee, you're probably not going to take everything with you. Um, but if you were going to leave, actually leave, yes, you would take your, your, your truck keys because you're not going to leave them in the tent all the rest of the night. You're going to take your phone, your truck keys, the rest of the stuff you may not care about because it's not stuff that's important and your truck's locked. So the police believe she left in a vehicle. And since her body has been found, not in the lake and not in, and not anywhere near that area, but farther away from that area, far enough that she didn't walk there. She had to be in a vehicle. So even before they found her body, they believe she left in a vehicle. And because she took her phone and her truck keys, I also believe before I even knew she was found that she left in a vehicle. The question is whose vehicle and why she was settled down for the night in theory, according to Jordy. Uh, and so why is she still not in a tent? But she left with a phone and some car keys. It doesn't sound like an abduction, does it? Uh, an abduction usually involves there's no sign of any anything messed up out there except for her jewelry laying on the ground. Um, so it sounds like she went with somebody, but who would she go with and why? If she met a hot dude at the, at the campsite, nothing like a little tent activity. Why would you go any place? Is he going to say, well, let's, let's ignore your tent. 
I know a really shitty motel down the road. The M doesn't work anymore. So it just says, hotel, hotel, hotel. We'll go there. Really? Or is he going to say, hey, let's, let's just leave your stuff here. Go to my place. And they drive off into the night to his place. I'm sorry. I, you know, there's nothing wrong with a tent for a little fun. I mean, it's romantic. You know what I mean? So why wouldn't she just, if she were going to do it, just have sex in the tent? Sit up at a campfire, look at the stars. Why would she, if she wants to camp, suddenly get up with some guy, jump in his vehicle and go off to some whatever? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, theoretically, could they've decided to go get something to eat? Okay, let's look at this. Um, I don't know what's in the area that's open at that time of night. I don't know what food items she had with her, whether she could have just suddenly gotten hungry and she's hanging out with this guy and... And he's like, hey, I'm, you know, why don't you why don't you come with me? I'm just going I'm going to come back. I got my camp thing set up. You want to just go get some pizza and bring it back. And she said, OK. So she grabbed her phone and her keys and got in his vehicle. That is a possibility. That's possible. But I have to know what's open around there that would make sense that they even bother to go. And why wouldn't she just, she's already in bed. It's after 12 o'clock at night. Is she really that hungry? <laughs> it's like, does she have no snacks? She seems competent. Again, I thought, is she going to, you're going to a party and campsite. I think you bring stuff with you. So did she not have something to eat? And she was, could, could just go to sleep. I mean, does she really want to run off with some guy and go to some 24 hour joint or to a, you know, some kind of 7-Eleven? I mean, I don't even know what's up there. I'd love to know. I'd love to know the area. So if you're you're from uh, British Columbia, if you're from Vanderhoof, uh, please put down where the heck would she go get some food in the middle of the night? Would she, you know, doesn't make any sense to you. So either she left, so it's one of two things. Uh, she left with somebody else or she left with Jordy. Those are the only two things that are possible. She didn't drive away. So it's Jordy or somebody from the party. I'm going to get into some of the possible suspects. I want to check on your comments before I go do that. Since there's like 200,000 comments. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, indicate she may have been ordered to leave her tent for some reason. Ordered to. Like with a gun? Um, well, okay. Um, I guess somebody could have put a gun to her and said, follow me. You're going with me. It's possible. I can't, I can't just say that's not true. It's unlikely just because it's, it seems like an odd thing, but could be, could it be true? Yes, it could be. So I'm sure they have to look into every one of those, anybody who's, uh, who was there it had to be somebody who was there. This is why I'll st stop right here. It's not the trail. Of, it's not going to be the highway of tears person. It's not a serial killer rolling down the highway of tears. She wasn't hitchhiking, you know, anything like that. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be a serial killer. Why? Because sometimes a person will grab a person. That they, there could be a serial killer who just happened to be a camp, in the camping at the party. Possible. He's at the party and then he saw this opportunity, he took it. But at another point in time, he would grab a hitchhiker. So you, can, you, you know, the modus operandi thing, you got to be a little careful of and say, oh, he would only ever take hitchhikers. No, sometimes they'll take what's ever available under the circumstances. Like maybe a friend invited him to the party. Maybe his friends all, whatever. He says, hey, there's a girl over there. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? So yes, is it possible? Yes. I think it's odd though that she would have her phone in her keys. I do. I think that's strange. Um, Let's see. Um, let's see what other thoughts you have on this. Huh, Leslie says, I take my phone everywhere. And yes, the bathroom, even at work. But I don't talk on the phone in the bathroom like some people. <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Kurtz, maybe he said girl down the hill. It is possible. You know, it is possible. Although... Girl, get in the car. Yeah, it's possible. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> at least when you die, you won't be eaten by cats. <laughs> That's because my cat's dead, but he would have eaten me. Ziggy died last year. He's the worst cat I ever owned. I call him the cat from hell. Everybody knows about Ziggy who's ever been on my show. Um, 
he was a beautiful cat, but he tried to kill me many times. But yet he loved me too. So it was a, he was a, a little psycho cat. But <laughs> he was a beautiful cat, but he did die last year. Old age. I didn't kill him. And um, by the way, I have a bowl of food over here for my 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 uh, the cat that's coming in, the stray cat. And he's been eating the food over here near the cat door. But yesterday, uh, it was very rainy. And I came out and I noticed the food was gone. And his little footprints were going around the island. So he's they, he's coming into the house a little further. So he's getting brave. So I just put the food bowl like right over here. like I can, So I can see it during the show. I put good food in it instead of dry food. And I was curious to see whether he would just sneak in. And I'd see him like eating. <laughs> it's a little test. But yes, um, my cat door is now open. So I might be eaten by raccoons or cats. But... That, that's possible. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Leslie says, it was very early for her after partying at night to stop at the site to get her stuff. Well, she had to go to work, you see. But yeah, she partied till at least 12 o'clock where she got injured. Then she left with a boyfriend. Um, so now we're getting home at one o'clock-ish. And is she suffering from pain or whatever? Um, is she having sex with a new boyfriend in spite of the pain? Um, and then she's recovering. So yes, it is quite early at eight, but she was there at eight thirty. So she had to leave by eight o'clock. So I just don't understand what the heck she's doing, feeling a need to pick up a sleeping bag and some clothing, you know, when she can call a friend and say, Hey, bring the sleeping bag and clothing with you. That to me is one of those things, red flags. You talk about red flags. That's a red flag to me. I, I just do not think that makes sense to me. Um, okay. Here's a good point. Kurt says maybe the phone was not on her, but the person who took her ditched it somewhere. Yes. Um, well, I do not believe the phone has been found, but I don't know if that's true or not. I, the phone was, I think it worked for a while, but then it stopped working. Um, I don't know what they got off of that phone issue. Uh, theoretically, yes, a person could have taken her phone and her, her vehicle keys. They could have, and then she could have ripped all her rings off and put them on the ground for I'm being, I'm being kidnapped. I mean, you could, you could go with these things. I just don't know they mean a lot. Um, it seems unlikely. I mean, if she had the, if she, okay, if she had the phone like this, like I do, if somebody kidnaps me, the phone is with me because it's, it's stuck there until they go, hey, wait a minute. I'm like, oh, stop doing that. <laughs> they take the phone out, you know, and they do something with it. Um, but the phone could also just, just as easily, if she'd been kidnapped right there, like if, if she was like doing stuff around the tent or, or walking about and the guy had a gun, she probably wouldn't have her vehicle keys with her. He's not going to go back and get the vehicle keys. He didn't take her vehicle. So that's why I think she left willingly. It doesn't seem like she was abducted. Just don't, I don't see the abduction. Uh, if she just had the, if she didn't have the vehicle keys, I might go with that, but she was ready for bed. So I'm, I'm not pretty sure she wasn't wearing the vehicle keys with her in the, I mean, in the sleeping bag. Now, I'll tell you what I do sometimes um, when I've traveled and stayed places where I wasn't a sleeping bag, well, in a youth hostel or something like that. I might have the keys at the bottom of the sleeping bag, so, you know, put them all the way to the very end of the sleeping bag so that that if I get up in the night and go to the bathroom, the keys are at the bottom. So somebody have to come into the tent, go into the sleeping bag and go down to the bottom of the sleeping bag. And I'm thinking they might not do that. Uh, I put things when I'm sleeping. I have put money down at the bottom of the sleeping bag as well as a way to ha keep the money hidden, but it's still with me. But if, if somebody came in and pointed a gun at me and told me to get out of my sleeping bag, the money's going to still be there. The keys are still going to be there. So I think she left willingly. Uh, I, I don't, I, th I don't know what they did with the tracking of the phone. The information is just not out there. Um, uh, Vital item. Well, she took the two most important things with her or somebody that say the two most important things that you would be careful not to leave would be a phone and your car keys and your vehicle keys. Absolutely. Um, yeah, her purse was. Yes, she, she was seen there. Um, it's not one of these fakey things. Um, her purse was in the vehicle. Now, I don't know. Again, she had her phone and maybe she had a wallet in there. She didn't want to worry about that. So maybe she had that tucked away someplace in the truck. It was locked. The truck, the car was locked. The truck was locked. I mean, sometimes people get overly like crazy about, oh, she wouldn't have done that. She would have. Okay. <laughs> you know, you're camping. You got your purse. You got to find someplace to put it. So you, I mean, if I'm in my vehicle, I put a lot of things in my trunk when I, I put purses in my trunk. Um, 
because I I because I drive a Mazda Miata and it's a convertible. So I, let's say I have the top down or I don't have the top down. You can't get into the trunk of the car by pulling something from inside the car. You have to have the key because that's what they do with convertibles. Otherwise, if you have your top down, people will be, you know, and your trunk will be popping up and they'd be stealing all your crap. So you have to have the key um, to get in. And so a lot of times if I go into a building, I don't want to carry stuff with me. I open up the trunk. I throw my purse in there and whatever else. Um, and so you just do what's reasonable. Um, can you be robbed? Yeah, you can be robbed. But Here's something. I give this advice to women all the time. I see these women that are going around with their little purses like this, a little paranoid again. Yeah. It's like, if you get robbed once every 20 years, you're not doing so badly. <laughs> it's not a nice thing, but I would rather walk around being happy and not worrying all the time. I mean, you keep your general eyes out. Don't do stupid stuff, but, but not be so paranoid that you make your life unhe unhealthy. So, if you're if you're if somebody grabs your bag once every 20 years, you lose. A, uh, first of all, I don't carry much money with me. So uh, cash, because we don't use cash anymore. But even then, you know, just don't carry too much. Um, yeah, it's a pain in the butt. You got to go and you got to cancel your credit card and you got to get a new a new license. And I don't know what else is in your purse. Um, it's it's annoying. It's annoying. I've never had my I've never had anything stolen from me. I, I'm amazingly lucky for all, all the travels I've done in my world. I've never, ever been robbed. And I use common sense and I use profiling methodology. I'm going to do part of the, I'm going to do some profiling while traveling shows to help people understand how to travel and do the smartest thing you can without being exhaustedly paranoid, you know? So I think she did what she had to do. She, she had some stuff with her. She locked up her, the, she locked up the, the, the expensive camera and her purse in the truck in some way or shape or form. It was, they were still there. She did the right thing. She had with her two things she needed, her phone and the keys to the, the truck, which she took with her. I say she went willingly for some reason, for some reason. Um, uh, uh, yes. Um, whoops, sorry. Hold on a second. Uh, the urgency of retrieving the item seems odd. Yes, Sarah. It's odd. And again, I like the way you're, I want to point out something you're saying, which is good. Not saying anything other than it's odd. Yes. Because I get attacked all the time for this. Well, that means you think she's guilty. No, <laughs> I cannot say she's guilty of anything. I'm just saying it is odd. I would like an explanation for that. It seems off to me. It's a red flag. Doesn't mean anybody's guilty. Maybe she's an oddball. <laughs> Maybe she's still drunk and thinks stupid things. I don't know. So, but it is one of those things, if you're doing uh, profiling or you're doing detective work, you have to note the things that stand out to you as being odd. Uh, because that may be, because there's something to that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, come with us. You can, you're drunk and can't drive. I'm not sure what you're replying to, but she's not. Yeah, okay, in theory, and theory, okay, again, in theory, let's, well, she was already in bed, so I don't think she's that drunk. I think she's already, she's already had enough of the party, and she's lying in for the night. Um, now, Jordy was pretty drunk, supposedly, so she did need somebody to drive her, um, and she decided to go with the, the boyfriend. Um, I don't know if what Jordy says, when she went back and said, uh, Madison doesn't want to go, I don't know if it's true. Just don't know. That's what she's saying. Now, to point out a couple of interesting things about the Jordy issue uh, a little further, and if you watch the 48 hours thing, um, she has this point in there, which just is weird. She says, they're talking about the polygraph test. She goes, I aced it. I aced the polygraph. And she, her expressions are like, she's real proud of herself. Why would you be proud of passing a polygraph? It's it's why? I mean, if you're telling the truth, you, there's nothing to be proud of. You can't ace a polygraph. You just answer the questions, and if you're telling the truth, that that's that. It's not not it's not it's, it's not like wow, didn't I do the coolest thing ever? No, you didn't. You just took a polygraph and you passed it. Although I don't know that you did. I don't know what the police have said she's passed it. Uh I don't know. You know, I don't know what the polygraph was about, what they said. They questioned her. She said for three months straight. They were very suspicious of Jordy. But now she's, I aced it. I aced the polygraph. 
Yeah, that that's okay. That's weird. Um, now, in the 48 hours, they say that she is no longer a suspect. I would like to know how. Uh, again, I'm not saying she's guilty of anything because I just don't know. I don't have all these details. But but if I'm looking at this case, I'm saying how how was she how is she no longer a suspect? Because if she was a suspect for three months, it means she doesn't have an alibi. And why doesn't she have an alibi? Because the people saw her after she left the campsite. And if she was accounted for being someplace else, she should have some alibi. Um, it doesn't appear to have one. Now, just because the police say she's no longer a suspect, that doesn't mean they're telling the truth either. Because the police are known to say that in order to get that person to go, I'm not a suspect anymore. Now I'll, keep t I'll talk junk. And since she talks a lot, they, maybe they think she'll just get drunk and say something stupid. So they may be baiting her. Or they may be saying, maybe they don't think she's a suspect anymore. Maybe they've got enough information on somebody else or you know whatever that has managed to clear her. But I just don't know that that's true. So again, this is an educational show. So I'm trying to help you understand things. Not, not that I can come to a conclusion absolutely on anything. But I found her, her behavior about this alibi. I mean, sorry, about the polygraph, weird. Again, she must be maybe just a, concern, a freaky girl, but I wouldn't let my son date her. Let me put it that way. <laughs> no, no. You know, um, <laughs> she, her behavior is weird all the way around, which is why she was looked at for at least three months. Now, um, the jewelry thing. It occurs to me the possibility that the jewelry was on her body when she was ditched, wherever she was ditched, wherever happened. It's possible that the jewelry was removed from her body before she was ditched or after she was ditched. Why do I say this? Let's say, let's say whoever had, um, whoever had Madison with them in their vehicle did something to her and she died one way or the other. Now they have a body which is highly identifiable through, through, through jewelry. Now she also had a tattoo, but the question is, who knew she had the tattoo? Uh, there's nothing they could do about the tattoo. Maybe they thought the animals would eat the tattoo. Um, but maybe they didn't want to leave the body with, with the, um, jewelry because they thought that would be identifiable. Now, mind you, I, I don't know whether their body was found with clothing. I do not know. Um, but it is possible the jewelry was removed. And if that jewelry was removed, then how did it end up back at the tent? Unless somebody took it back there and placed it outside the tent. which is a pretty weird thing to do. I just don't understand why the jewelry, according to her, is laying outside the tent. Why Why in the world would Madison take off her jewelry for any reason and put it outside? Now, I can understand she went to bed. If she went to bed, let me think about this. I don't know. It depends how much people like to sleep with jewelry on. Is it possible? Is it possible she took the jewelry off because she's uncomfortable with it in bed? Uh, earrings. And she put it on the floor of the tent and somewhere between the time she left, whatever reason she did, and Jordy showed up in the morning, somehow the, the jewelry got knocked through the tent door because the door was supposedly unzipped. Now, usually, mind you, though, from what I know from tents, is, is usually there's a there's some part that goes up because you don't want the water just to roll in. So it's not like when you unzip the tent, the bottom of the tent is completely flat so that you would kick the jewelry out by accident. Um, there would still be that little part of the bottom of the tent that comes up or the floor of the tent. And so the jewelry should be trapped. So I can't really come up with a good reason why the jewelry is on the outside of the tent, according to her. That's something I'd love to know from the police reports. 
was a jewelry there? Why does she, why is she saying that? It's very interesting to me because I can't see a good reason for Madison to take off her jewelry and put it outside the tent. But I can see the possibility of somebody removing the jewelry from her and then putting it outside the tent. And of course that would mean the per only person that was back at the tent at 8.30 in the morning was Jordy um, when she was supposedly needing to pick up her clothing and her sleeping bag. For reasons completely unknown. So that is an interesting issue. Let me show you the last interesting issue. And you can tell me then um, what you think of this. Um, because here again is where you have problems with information, where the information is useful or not useful. Okay, let me find my little teeny picture. Okay, okay. How about this one? Okay, ah, I got it. Okay, so let me show you again where things are. This is Hogsback Lake. This is Vanderhoof. All right, this is the, this is the Highway of Tears. Okay. Now, if you look here, down here is, is, is the lake. There are two ways to get to Vanderhoof. One is going straight up this way, and the other is a little bit longer trip that way. All right. Now, there is, I'm going to show you something on a better map. There was a story going around, and I say going around. When they, when they found her body, they, they, that they had found her body in a certain location, uh, at a certain far, uh, at, the cer at a certain a farm. Uh, there was a man's farm, and he had two sons. I had several pieces of garbage, but I don't know that that's true. So they were supposedly talking with a man, um, I guess checking, getting a whatever search warrant of this farm. The concept being that if it's on the farm itself, did somebody who was at the party live at that farm, grab her, take her back, do something to her, and then leave her body on some some area of the farm, which was probably far away from the farmhouse, you see. And so therefore, her body wasn't found for a long time. Now, I don't know, but maybe they're idiots, but if I were kidnapping somebody, I wouldn't take them back to my land. I'd leave them on somebody else's land. You know, that's what I would do. But that doesn't mean there's not stupid people out there. So... There was a story going around, however, that the the location of her body being found was at a place called, um, now I can't read the damn thing. Um, <laughs> it's too small, uh, South, South, South Slope Road. I think that's what it is. Too small for me to see. South Slope Road, wait a minute, let me check my iPad. I can actually see on that thing. Um, uh, is that the name of the place? Um, yeah, South Slope Road. Okay. Now, the reason that, that if that were true would make it very interesting is if you were at Hogsback Lake and you were returning to Vanderhoof, do you see that on the way there, you could just pull off on that little road, do whatever, dump a body there, and then keep going to Vanderhoof? It's very convenient for somebody who, as a Hogsback, to drop that body and can continue onward. Now, there's only one problem with this story is that recently the police have said, came out and said the body was to the east of Vanderhoof. So east and South Slope Road is slightly west. So I don't know whether the body was found east, like this kind of east or Southeast or I don't know. I have no clue. Um, now, if it was found here, not on South Slope Road, but this, this, this alternate road to Vanderhoof body was found here. That is East of Vanderhoof. They might want, not want to say exactly where it was there. Well, they haven't, we'd have no idea where the body actually was found at this point. Uh, but somebody coming out of here would have two roads going North. One is this way. And one is this way. Now, it's also possible if, if the South Slope Road is nonsense and the body's actually here, you can have the same issue. The person could be going this way back to Vanderhoof, dump the body here or here or here, and then keep going to Vanderhoof. Now, does that say who killed Madison Scott? Or that even, Mad first of all, let me stop. We don't know that Mad Madison Scott was murdered. Just to be clear. She could have gotten in somebody's vehicle 
and had a drug overdose. Supposedly she wasn't a, that kind of person to do drugs, but she could have had drug overdose and died and they didn't know what to do with her. So they chucked her out. She could have had a heart attack and they freaked out and chucked her out. Just saying. She could have gotten angry and jumped out of the vehicle and then died of the elements. Also, I'm just pointing these things out. Um, there was another theory, by the way, just a let me mention it just because uh, I forgot to. Um, she had a guy that she had seen a couple of times, um, a young man, uh, this guy, a fairly handsome fellow, but apparently was into drugs and owed a lot of money to drug people and some people thought that she was killed because of him. Um, because, well, mostly because after she went missing, he also went missing and his head was found in somebody's house. So yeah, just his head. So um, somebody did kill him and cut his head off. So not the greatest guy to date. Um, but the police have said there's no connection. The family has said there's no connection. Uh, and I don't think there's any connection at all. I think it's just one of those freaky, you know, wow, she died and then you know, something happened to him. Um, so I think that I'll go back to what I think. I think that she left the lake with somebody. I just, I just don't see her being abducted from the lake. It does seem to seem, seem to me like she left with somebody. Um, for, I don't know what reason, um, but she took the phone and the, and the truck keys. That's very, that's very important to me. So I would be asking three major questions. One, can we prove that she was seen after Jordy left? Because if she wasn't actually seen after Jordy left, then she could have left with Jordy after all. Jordy could have said, I'm, I don't want to leave you here for the night. Come with me. We'll come back in the morning. I'll drop you back off in the morning at 8.30, which would be reasonable. And then if you, you can collect the, get your stuff and get your truck, that could have happened. But that could have. But we, if but if she really was seen after Jordy left, then that would not be true. Um, then she would have had to leave with somebody else. For what reason? I just don't know. She has her own truck. She can she can go places on her own. Why does she need to leave with somebody else? And so that's a question that has to, would. That's a good question. Again, would where she it doesn't make sense to me. If she was going to have a little romantic tryst, she could do it in the tent. Um, does she really need to buy, get food at that hour? It just doesn't just doesn't make a lot of sense that she left with somebody for no good reason. So I think that is why Jordy is still was the number one suspect, and her new boyfriend. I'm not saying they're guilty. I can, but I understand why they're the number one suspect. Also, the rings are being jewelry are being left outside the tent almost seems like somebody put them there when they retrieved other things for no reason. So. Not being on the outside of the case, looking at things, Georgia doesn't look good, but I don't have all the inside information. Maybe she did truly pass their polygraphs. They found enough of her, eventually for an alibi. Or they found somebody else they thought was more likely to have done it. Maybe there's an answer for the jewelry outside. Maybe there's an answer for everything. And I don't know where her body was found yet. And maybe that's going to be a new clue. But it's been another year and we've heard nothing. So that's where I stand on this. I think she left with somebody of her own accord, but never got home or never got to where she was going or never got back. Let me go to your comments on this now. Oh, yeah, fascinating case. I just wish, I mean, I'd love to see what all the, I'd love to know what the parents have. I've always wanted to visit British Columbia. <laughs> just saying, I know I'm fascinated by the case and that I feel like the answer's there. I do feel like the answer is there. I, I don't know whether it can be proven, but I just feel like it's there. And if her parents ever see this video, um, I just think you sound like you had the greatest daughter ever. Um, you know, I'd be proud to have her for my daughter. And I think she seemed like she just did smart things in life and that she knew she was so competent. And I just think she, if she left that campground, she didn't think anything bad was going to happen to her. And she was, Sensible enough to take her truck, her truck keys and her, and her phone. That doesn't sound like somebody is an idiot. Um, she didn't take her purse, but I'm guessing that maybe there was not that much in the purse that was worth worrying about. She didn't take the camera. Maybe she thought she was just going someplace quickly and come back. I just don't know. I don't know what really, I don't know what's the truth about Jordy, and I don't know much about who, else, who the other people were. Wish I did. So it's a, it's, you know, I wish I had more information. 
absolutely do. Um, let's see. Uh, see what your thoughts are here. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, that's true. I forgot about that. Um, Sky Rick, uh, Kurt said this. I, hi, Sky Ricky, by the way. A uh, sister came to the party the next day. The party was two days long. Yeah, people. So I'm thinking some people must have stayed over. Um, it wasn't like you were totally alone there. And, and yeah, that's when they found that the, you know, the, the, the tent was smashed. That, yeah. Um, see, uh, if Jody is involved, maybe she brought the brings back that morning. And the reason she went back to make it look like it was a signal from her. Yeah, well, that's what she's claiming. That That's what she is actually claiming. She is, Jordy is claiming that maybe uh, Madison took these off and left them there. She was being abducted to say I'm being abducted. I just don't know how that makes sense. Now, if she dropped them like a bread trail, you know what I mean? One after the other, oh, look, she's dropped her jewelry and then her phone's in the bushes and the car keys are thrown. That would make more sense. She was abducted then, but nothing, it doesn't look like she was abducted. So I'm saying that leaving a jewelry supposedly outside the tent does not look like an abduction to me. So <laughs> is Pat falling in love with a cat? No, nah, I'm just I'm just playing with the cat at the moment. I don't really need another cat in my life, but I, as long as he just comes and goes, I'll be I'll be okay with it. I don't want to I, I don't want to take care of it. <laughs> is that why you can't put Is that why you can't put your phone down here? <laughs> I don't know if that was the that was the uh, the question. Um. Uh, Uh, there are so many weirds and perverts in campgrounds. I hear stories like this all the time. There's a whole, pa uh, I don't, if you're listening, by the way, are you listening to that guy's 911, whatever he is? If you're listening to that guy, stop listening to him. The guy's a crackpot. Um, I forgot what the name of his show is, but it's 911. He goes on about everybody disappe disappearing and aliens and stuff. Get away from that guy. He's a, he's a loon. He's an absolute loon. And, um, but a lot of people are falling for his stuff. Um, Sarah says, Pat, isn't it important to understand what kind of motive is at play here to best profile this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Boy, do I have to laugh sometimes. Um, no, not at you. But the whole point is, it's, don't I wish I knew what the motive was? I have no clue. Yeah. When you're profiling a crime, are you developing a profile? Are you analyzing the evidence, doing crime scene analysis? Um to see the concept of profiling to me is, is 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 stupid a lot of times to begin with the the idea of personality profile profiling the killer where again i'm going to say well it's a white guy 25 to 30 who has a porn collection and hunts cuz it's hunting territory he's no i wouldn't say he's got a porn collection let's see I would say, let me see if I make, I can make one up right away. Well, she's a young woman. So I'm going to say uh, her, her abductor, her killer was 20 to 30 years old, um, lives in the area, um, owns, owns a vehicle, um, likes hunting, uh, has, has, uh, has trouble interacting with people without, he has a rage problem um, and might sell drugs and uh, probably has trouble keeping long-term jobs and he's probably not married and uh okay that that's a, that's the profile <laughs> is it possible well sure um because it's very vague and uh it's not really based on evidence outside of he has a vehicle person who she's with took her and did something to her has a vehicle because She's missing, and the person had to have a vehicle to move her from one location to the other. So vehicles, as obvious to anybody, you don't have to be a profiler or a detective to figure that out. Um, sometimes the motive is murky, and you know if 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 she's if it's found to be a sexual homicide, well then the motive no longer is murky. Uh, but if it's something else, an argument gone bad. Um, uh, it could be anything, you know, it could be, it could be still, uh, you know, let's say, let's say she was in the car with Jordy and the new boyfriend and Jordy passed out and the new boyfriend made a pass at her and they got into a fight and he strangled her or pulled her out of the car and raped her. 
Maybe Jordy doesn't even know what happened. Maybe he just dumped her body on the side of the road and kept going. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could make up all kinds of stories, but I don't know. Um, so motive sometimes is obvious and sometimes it's something you have to discover through a lot of investigation and, and evidence collection, having to know whether, uh, and sometimes you don't figure out the motive till later. Um, and then you have to say to yourself, well, um, I mean, sexual homicides are pretty easy motives. They're serial killers, they're serial killers, power control and cheap thrills and rape is one cheap thrill and one method of power and control. So, you know, uh, I think too much is made of that sometimes. Now, is the motive of robbery gone bad? Uh, the person was being robbed. Um, were they, or was it a drug deal gone bad? Was it was an assassination? Where Was it a hit? Uh, where, where, you know, was somebody hired to kill somebody? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, husband hired somebody to kill his wife. I mean, these are different. There are different motives. But the question is, in this particular case, we don't know much about the actual crime other than to know, in my opinion, she left of her own accord with her phone and her keys and was never seen again. I don't know what the condition of her body is yet. I don't know if they found it was a sexual homicide. I don't know. I don't know. Just, I don't know enough. All I know is that she wasn't attacked there and she had a way to get, she had a way to go home and she needed a way to go home. She had a truck. She didn't need to leave. She could just go to sleep in the tent. She's camper. She's a camper. So why did she leave is the big question. She had to have some reasonable reason to go with somebody. Who was that somebody? And then that somebody did have a motive or something went wrong after the vehicle left the grounds. There was something that was unex un unexpected occurrence, uh, shall we say. So don't don't I wish I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at the concept that is there always a way to know motive and profile? Again, I think I explained this on my last show, the four kinds of profile, uh, TV profiling, which is what I did for years, which was I get, I get an email and I say, oh, this is the case we're talking about the next 20 minutes. Okay. And they say, so Pat, what do you think? And then I give my quick, my sound bite, and then they cut you off and go to somebody else. Um, occasionally I could get a little bit more information and do a better job of profiling, but I call it TV profile because it has a limit to how much time you can put into the information that you get. Then you have what I call YouTube profile, where I have a lot more, oh, that's not the next one, YouTube profile, where I have a lot more time. I did get to watch a documentary, study different things about the case. It's still not great. I don't have inside information. It's, 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 it's an educational channel to help you understand things. And that's the best I can do under these circumstances. Then, then I have the cases where I actually work the cases. That's true profiling, true profiling, where I can, I actually worked with the police department. I saw all the files. I saw the crime scene photos. I could thoroughly, to thoroughly analyze. Then I could then put out a profile of the case. And oftentimes, yes, I could put in motive depending on what I saw um, as to what the motive was. Now, for example, uh, I'll try to link that one below. Um, if I always remember, I always forget by the time I get to the, putting the show up for public, I forgot to put the links in. I just said I do. But anyway, uh, uh, the South Carolina case, the, uh, the, the super bikes, super bikes murder. Um, the, I think the wrong guy has been charged and convicted. That was ridiculous. Todd Cole, I don't believe for a minute is the super bikes murderer because I worked that case and he, it's not him. Uh, he took a plea deal because he was already caught for serial, being a serial killer. And they, he did not commit this four person mass murder in a motorcycle shop. However, they came up with a motive for him. The motive was that a year after he bought a motorcycle and somebody there at the shop laughed at him because I guess he wobbled or fell off or whatever. Somebody laughed at him. He, a whole year went by and he decided to go in and kill everybody in the, in, in the shop for revenge. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Now, my, my top suspect, I have a motive for, and I think it was because he was cut off from relationships with people in the shop, and that pissed him off. Um, that was that was a motive I thought was more reasonable. Now, I'm not saying that the guy I had as my top suspect is guilty because he's proven to be guilty, but I would lean that direction. Slightly different motive because of the way the crime went down. So 
Yeah, you, the more you know, the more you can come up with motive. There are some times when you just getting inside of the head of the killer is is pointless. So you just go with, we got him. <laughs> we don't care why I did it. <laughs> um, uh, that's a good point. A truck is better than a tent for purses, phones you need. Yeah, well, the phone, the phone you need, correct. The purse you don't. It's, it's just a good place to store crap. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is the big problem, Kathy. We do not actually know the last time she was seen. We have no clue. Um, so she, the last time she might have been seen was, well, Jordy claimed she saw her about, what, 1230? And either I believe Jordy is telling the truth in the sense that she either saw her and left without her or she saw her and left with her. Um, if she didn't leave with her, then the last time she was seen after that is questionable. I don't have any evidence of who said they saw her. You got a lot of drunk people leaving the party. First of all, I don't know how many people knew her. And where was she for them to say, hey, you want to come with us? So supposedly they asked her if she wanted to go with them. Why? She has a truck there. Why would she want to go with them anyway? You know, and she's and isn't she back in her tent sleeping? I mean, I don't even know how they'd know anything. Why they even bother with her? So unless she got back up again and went back into the party. So this is where, if I were privy to the information, I'd be checking out all the statements of those 50 or so party goers and find out all the information about her, her movements during that whole night and morning as to the party and the party people and locations to see what she was doing. I mean, it's possible she, after Jordy left, um, she said she couldn't fall asleep and she just said, screw it. And she got back up and went out to the party and drank some more. And God knows, maybe she got so drunk she didn't realize she was doing a dicko off with some guy. You know, who's, maybe she got hungry. And he said, hey, let's go get some pizza. And she said, okay. And she got in this car and left. Maybe that happened. The problem is, I just don't know. Just don't know. Um, but that's a good question. Um, let me go back down here again. Uh, uh, good question, Sky Ricky. Did they check to see if the truck left and then returned later that night? Uh, I don't know. That is, but that's a perfectly good question. Because could it have left? Could she have said to herself, damn, I'm hungry. And said, she jumps in the vehicle, she goes someplace. But then she comes back, but then she, why would she leave again with somebody else? See, that that really wouldn't make any sense. So, um, unless, they don't, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, go, you could go through some scenarios. You could say the new boyfriend didn't actually have a vehicle, so they took they they took Madison's vehicle, and then they brought their vehicle back in the morning. But then they wouldn't have another vehicle. Or he had <laughs> just gets all messy. Uh, to me, the point being that she did have a truck there. I, I, I think the only two reasons she would have left without her own dang truck is if. She did leave with Jordy because Jordy said, look, I'll bring it back in the morning. And then, you know, just don't worry about it. just, you know, just jump in my, our vehicle, go with us. Um, you won't be on the road alone. And we'll bring you back in the morning before I go to work. That seems reasonable to say. I, and she's like, okay, I don't want to stay here all night. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with you. Stay at my house. Just drop me at my house, pick me up in the morning and I'll come back and I'll stay part of the next day. I'm going to just keep, I'm going to keep camping out there. Maybe I'll camp the next night. Um, maybe I'll do some hiking in the park or whatever. I got my truck there. So that's cool. That makes sense. She might've said that. If it wasn't Jordy, why would she go with somebody? And there's very, now that's a little bit more difficult. Now, is it possible? Okay, let's, let's look let's to another scene. Let's say Jordy's left. She decided not to go with Jordy, but two hours later, she said, geez, I feel like crap. Um, and some other person she knew said, hey, what, I'll drop you at your house and I'll pick up in the morning. We'll come back same scenario. So you don't have to worry about taking down your tent tonight or dealing driving or whatever, because you're kind of too drunk. So I'll be, I'll be your sober driver. So just, just, just grab your phone, your, your truck keys and I'll, and I'll drop you at your house and pick you up in the morning and bring it back. Did somebody else do the, say that exact thing. Maybe my guess is then she had to know them. She wouldn't go off with a total stranger. You know, that makes no sense. I mean, it's possible because he can get stupid. He seems like a nice enough guy. He'll drop me in my house. You live in Vanderbilt too? Okay, drop me in my house. He says, okay. And he doesn't. So yes, it is possible. She could have gone off with another person 
besides Jordy, and under the same condition, she finally decided, I don't want to stay here the night for whatever reasons. I'll just go and come back in the morning. And she did. And she just never made it back. So, yeah, see, these are these are all the different possibilities. Um, and she could have. But we just don't know. We just don't know. Um, makes just... Uh, what if the jewelry just landed there? She tossed and turned. Is it what's going to fall off her ears and her hands? <laughs> I mean, I know most most of our rings don't just pop off, you know, and our earrings don't fall out. So no, I, I don't think so. I think that'll be a unlikely. Um, oh, this guy, Kurt says this a Ligabakov dude or whatever his name is could have attended the party since it was announced on Facebook and he was active there. So I don't rule it out. Was he, was he, was he, yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah. I mean, I would assume if he was at that party, he would be a number one suspect at this point. Um, but I, I'd have to go back and see whether he had already been arrested uh, or, you know, that's what the police will be looking into all, all the other, you know, the usual suspects in a, in a case like that that they would have known if he was there or not. And he was there and he killed other girls. Well, yeah, I, I'd go with him. <laughs> and Harper says 90% sure she knew a murder. I, I, I think 90% is a good, good bet. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, oh, that's a good question, Julia. If she was uncomfortable wearing jewelry while camping, why did she even wear it? I don't wear much when camping. Um, I don't know, maybe during the day you like to be cool. And then when you get in bed, you're like, yeah, it's just, just annoying, you know? Um, I'm trying to think, um, I never wear jewelry to bed. The only thing I wear is these stupid, these stupid cheap earrings. Uh, if I have my real good earrings on, uh, no, I, I would put them back in the box. I wouldn't wear any jewelry to bed. Um, I, except when I was married, I did have my wedding ring in my my engagement ring. Those I always wore. Uh, but every other piece of jewelry, I take it off. If I were going camping, well, she wasn't wearing expensive jewelry, as far as I can see. You know, so it's it's not like, um, yeah, if I, if I go traveling, like if I go traveling in certain countries, I only wear very simple silver jewelry that is not, not expensive um, or fake silver <laughs> or metal. Uh, if I'm in India, yes, I do sometimes wear gold because I'm with Indian people and they have safes in their house and you put your, put your uh, jewelry in their safe and then you can go out to parties in your sari and get all dressed up. But depending on where you're going, I wear way less jewelry if I'm visiting India than I would if I were wearing it here. I only take a few specific items, not the bigger pieces, the smaller pieces. Um, but yeah, um, uh, camping, I probably would not take a thing. Yeah, but she's younger, you know, and she might, she's gonna be with her friends. She, you know, first of all, think about it as partying. If you're camping, if I'm camping alone in Assadig Island, I'm not with anybody. I don't care that I, mean, I was young, so my face looked good. Didn't need makeup. Um, I wasn't going to wear jewelry. But if I, let's say there's going to be parties and I was going to join the parties, I might want to have a cool outfit, uh, or, you know, some jeans and a cool shirt and some pretty jewelry. I might want to do that if I were. So I could see why she might have had jewelry. Hmm. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, huh. the little girl couldn't move Madison. She is a lightweight. Yeah, she looks very small. No, I mean, one would assume if she had anything to do with it, it had to do with the guy she was with as well. There were two of them. They were together. So, but again, I'm not saying she had anything to do with it, but she's got some really quirky things that she says that make no sense. I would just love to know the actual answers to that. Um, <laughs> well, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, um, why do people talk about accidents and why people uh, cover them up? People do really stupid things when it comes down. They're, they're afraid of the police. Maybe they're drug, maybe they're doing drugs and the person has an accident and they think, Oh my God, I'm going to be, no, I'm going to be accused of killing her. I'm going to be accused of giving her drugs. I'm going to be accused of this or that. So sometimes people do actually dispose of bodies that are overdosed. People have overdosed. I've disposed of them because they're afraid of being, yeah, police coming after them and, or an accident that looks like you could have killed them. 
people have accidents and you know it's like let's say somebody trips and hits their head on a on a you know on a table and lays on the floor and you think oh my god i might have you know they're gonna think i killed the person i gonna think i hit them over the head so people do get rid of bodies that they didn't actually murder so um Oh, there's a, okay, that, Kurt, that's a good one. See, you're all learning good profiling skills. Somebody said there's an emergency and lured her. She grabbed what's in the tent and went. Uh, that could be. Um, now, they, again, I think we'd be talking about somebody she knew because I don't think if somebody, a stranger came up and said, it's an emergency, that she would just go with them and then jump in their vehicle. I mean, um but if somebody knew her and said there's an emergency back at your house or Jordy and her boyfriend just crashed, I, I guess you might go with somebody, jump into their vehicle. That's possible. So I think that's a, that's that's um that's not a bad um concept. I'd add that to the list. Mm, very good. Very good. Um uh I don't think she wanted to leave after going home and changing tents. Why would she leave? Oh, yeah, she worked hard to go. Yeah, she, she got this too small a tent, I think, for her and, and Jordy. And she thought, oh, I got the wrong tent. So she drove all the way home to get the bigger tent. You think she's there for the night. I mean, she's a camper. I don't know why she would feel a need to leave. Um, I don't. Uh, unless she didn't want to be alone in the tent. Um, unless she decided... Maybe I, for whatever reasons, yeah, screw it. I'll just go home and come back and I'll, I'll stay overnight tomorrow. Maybe just, you know, it, it's hard to, you cannot really put yourselves in people's heads to that extent. All you can do is make a list of the possibilities and then take those possibilities and look for how they would pan out. What would be needed for those things to happen? So if she decided to leave to go back home for the night, who would she go with that she wasn't going to take her own dang truck? Because her own truck is there. So, is she, you know, why, why, why wouldn't she drive her own truck? And who would be she would take the ride with thinking she was going to be dropped off at her house and brought back in the morning? Because obviously, or her sister was coming down the next day. Maybe she, this is a possibility too. She said, oh yeah, uh, uh, just, just take me home and drop me off. My, uh, my sister will bring me back in the morning. That could be true too. But you'd have to go through all these things. That's what her parents, I'm sure, have done with that board they've got in their house that they're working so diligently with for, for years is to go through all the possible scenarios and to see whether any of those scenarios match the actual evidence that that exists and explains anything. So quite, quite a quite a tricky thing here. Um, Harpa says, Jordy also has a very specific reason she thinks Madison left the rings. Yeah, well, that's why oh, yeah, we went through that one. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, but then again, maybe Jordy just likes to play detective and she thinks it's a smart thing to say. Hey, maybe she's right, but you know. <laughs> so... I'd love to see the rest of Jordy's interview. I really would. Just curious because she's an interesting character. That's all I can say. Um, uh, could she have been drunk? And yeah, it's possible. She could have gotten drunk and then decided she, she felt really sick and wanted to go home and got in a car with somebody. It's possible. Maybe she was being a responsible person saying, oh, I'm not going to drive. I just don't feel well. Um, I'm going to go home, sleep it off and come back in the morning. Possible. Oh, park predators. Okay, that's better than that 911 nut, nut case. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know the park predators one, but parks are interesting places. That's a reason that would be a reasonable um that's a reasonable uh stories to do, okay? Because yes, parks parks are isolating places. We have people who are killed on the Appalachian Trail in the US. Um, while they're camping and while they're hiking, we have people, w women who are killed jogging on and in, in, in parks. Um, so parks, now park predators makes total sense to me because predators do pick isolated places. So that might be a good show, <laughs> just not the nine one one guy because he's just crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Um, I love a good view from the tent. Huh? That is true. That's very nice. Aww. Uh. I move the move the truck if the truck's in the way of ruining things. Yeah, I, I can see that. that. That makes sense. Um, let's see. No one's arrested. This is correct. No one's been arrested. It's just just frustrating, and they haven't said anything. So I don't know if they're onto something or not. I'd be. I'm real curious to see if they 
come to a resolution in this case or not. Um, but they they have a better shot than the Trail of Tears, uh, uh, Highway of Tears issue, because she wasn't out hitchhiking. When you're hitchhiking, the entire called the entire British Columbia is a suspect. She at least was here where there's a limited amount of suspects. That's the advantage in this particular case. There's a chance to figure out who it was. And the fact her body was found between this location and, and, uh, and the town also says most likely the person's very local. They're local. They're not passing through. This person, whoever took her, whoever she went with and whoever killed her, if that's what happened to her, is local. That, that's that'd be part of my profile, local. And so therefore, you do have a small group of, of, sus, of suspects. Although, because it was a party, that's a fairly large small group, shall we say. But way better than, hey, who do you think grabbed the girl hitchhiking on the highway? No clue. <laughs> no clue at all. Um, um, <laughs> well, it's funny because another person has said this. I honestly think that Jordy is too dumb <laughs> and probably confused the police by babbling too much. <laughs> and that is possible. Very, 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 very possible. I just, I, I, I would say the things that concern me most is the return in the morning to get her clothes, which just doesn't make sense without phoning her and asking her to bring the stuff along. I don't know why she needs to go back to the campsite. That's the one that bothers me more than the jewelry is weird too. I, the jewelry thing is second. So it's returning to the campsite is first. Jewelry is second. That she left and, you know, was going back toward that area. And she could have had uh, Madison with her is the third. So there are three reasons why I would at least look at her. And the fact she said she aced the polygraph and grinned about it like it was a really cool. What, you got away with something? Is that what you're trying to tell us? You got away with it? That's how you aced it? Yeah. Or is it just you're weird? <laughs> maybe you're just weird and maybe you're, I don't know, she does drugs and stuff. I just don't know. But that's why she was a suspect for three months. And wh whether they're saying she's not a suspect now is a lie or it's the truth, I do not know. But she left with somebody. And I believe the somebody she probably had, she probably did know them. That would be my guess. Um, So anyway, yeah, let me see a couple last comments. Yeah. So that's it. That's that's my thoughts on this case. I think it's um very interesting, but it's not one of those you can come to a, an easy conclusion with. Uh, it, it just brings up more questions in a sense of, you know, exactly what happened and, and who was involved. Um, but it's interesting. It's a really interesting case. And I've, uh, you know, when I was asked to do this case, I think I put that on the back burner quite a few times. I was going to thinking of just doing it as a short thing during a hangout, but then I got more interested in it and I thought, okay, and I found her body. It says, it's, it's just, yeah, let me do a full show on it. So that's why I did the full show. Um, so I'm glad you were here today. Uh, if you're in the chat room now, you're hopefully you'll come to the hangout, which will be on Wednesday or Thursday, early this uh, three o'clock in the afternoon or four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then, uh, next, next weekend, I'll be doing the Todd Willingham case. I was begged to do that one and I didn't do it for a long time because I need to study fire arson. And it's a, it's a case where Todd Willingham supposedly, he was convicted of setting a fire by arson that killed his three children and, um, he got executed and the innocence project went after this one uh, post-mortem and, uh, or post execution, shall I say, and um, both, <laughs> and uh, and he was ex found exonerated in the eyes of Texas or whatever. Uh, the exact wording I'm not sure of that he did not com he did not set the fire that killed his children. So I'm going to get into do I believe that is true or don't I believe that is true? Do I think he was convicted wrongly? Um, and they, they there's a lot of talk about. Uh, junk science being used back when it happened, which was quite a few years ago. And now, you know, the, the fire and guy who did it was not using proper techniques and all that. So very interesting case. Um, so it takes, it's taken a bit of studies to try to understand the case and what I actually think of it, um, whether I think, boy, they really did execute this poor guy who lost his kids because that's, that, that's, that would be a terrible thing or whether he probably did it, but you know, but now an innocence project is rolled through. So it's, I'm, I'm still, I'm still studying it heavily. So 
I've got another week to study. I've gotten all the documentation I can possibly find on the case. Oddly enough, there's certain documentation which is missing, but I've worked hard to find as much documentation as I can. Uh, trial documentation, books on the case and all, all of that. There's a couple of documentaries. So I'll send that information over to you during the week. So I will be doing that next weekend. So um, uh, oh, that's uh, Julia's just saying at the end here. Um, uh, yeah, I don't understand. Uh, rings pointing to an abduction. If our investigator immediately becomes suspicious of Jordy. The question is, what, did she bring the rings back? I mean, that that's the thought that came to my head. It's just that, why would the rings be there? I just, that's the, uh, why would the rings be there? Did she leave them there or did she not leave them there? Did somebody bring them back? And that could be somebody else besides Jordy as well. It could be the other person who came back to the, the party site and dumped them there. Who knows? I, I don't know. So, you know, it all depends who the heck Madison went off of, off with. Oh, aren't you, aren't you nice? <laughs> I love you too, Lisa. <laughs> That's why I love my patrons, because I get to know you guys. Um, that Todd Willingham case sounds so sad. Not sure I would have a stomach for that. Actually sounds like he's innocent. It's a very interesting case. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll see whether you have a <laughs> stomach or not. Um, let's see. Any other thoughts before? Uh, thank you, Kurtz. Appreciate that. So, um, Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> and let's see, any last comments here? Um, <laughs> um, and most welcome. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, I'll, I'll take it. I'll end it here. All right. So I will see some of you uh, during the middle of the week and some of you next weekend. And if you're new to the show again, all my shows are public. You don't have to become a patron. But if you'd like to be in that chat room, click below. Some people have asked me why I have uh, lives for just patrons. It's because I like having a nice community and not a whole pile of people from everywhere showing up. Sometimes there's haters and bots and crazy peoples and makes a very wild, un un unpleasant show for me. I want to be able to focus on what I'm talking about without everything going kablooey. And um, so I prefer not to do lives publicly. But if you'd like to be in one of the public and would like to be in one of the lives, you can just join Patreon. Again, five bucks a month. It's cheap and it supports the channel. But you don't have to, but you do at least subscribe to the channel because that does make a huge difference. And check out my playlists because everything is there. And if you're studying to be a detective, if you're studying to be a profile, or if you just want to study logic or how things just how things work, um, that's what I'm here for. It's, a, you know, to... Make it a learning place uh, as opposed to just a story place or or just a gossip place. It's a learning place. So I hope I hope you get that out of the, the shows because that's that's my purpose. So anyway, and, besides, and the other reason why I do the lives with patrons and not just videos is because when you do videos, you're always by yourself. And I work in front of my house and it's I don't mind doing the videos when I have something shorter, I want to say. But man, I, I uh this is like going to work for me. I get to be here with my with friends and coworkers and and have a better time. And I like doing things that I enjoy, you know. So I enjoy this. I enjoy you guys. You're great. Okay. Thank you guys for being here, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.